All right. It's interesting when you hear a whole passage read aloud, it kind of sinks in a little bit deeper, doesn't it, than when you're just reading it quickly and, yeah. So what a challenging passage of Scripture, as is all of James, eh? So we're going to um, be unpacking that a little bit more this morning. Um, but before we do that, um, I just wanted to uh, just touch on something serious here about, uh, about giving, um, just as a little bit of an update uh, for everyone we don't often talk about, um, uh, you know, giving so much, we always pray over our giving every week, but uh, uh, at the beginning of this year, we, we took up our, uh, for some of you that maybe are, are newer here, we, we finished our auditorium here, uh, and so we, we took out a, a small mortgage with our, with our movement, which is an a almost interest-free loan, which is really great. Uh, so we, we started paying that back this year, but also at the start of this year, we got uh, hit with an insurance bill that nearly tripled, uh, which was actually, it actually ends up more than our mortgage, just for our insurance, which is pretty insane. Uh, so that was not budgeted for, we had budgeted for uh, repaying the mortgage and all of that sort of stuff, but the insurance has been quite crippling um, for us. So I just want to encourage you, uh, for those of you that already give generously, we are so thankful for all that you do give. And uh, But if you currently aren't giving or um, you would like to start giving, we would really appreciate uh, that at the moment we are about $500 short every week. Um, see, there's a lot of things that we like to do in our community, and that's not something we're willing to compromise on. Um, we just believe that as a, a body of Christ, we can be uh, generous and that we can uh, fulfill all our requirements as a church family. So uh, if you're interested in giving um, or you want to know a little bit more about what we believe about giving, I've done a, a, a couple of series and recently on our, in our last series um, spoke on, on giving. So if you want to have a listen to that, you can do that. Otherwise, um, feel free uh, to, to start giving if you're not. We'd love, love you to join with us in that part of worship. Awesome. All right. James 4, uh, as we've just read, is, uh, man, it's a pretty, James isn't mucking around in this one, is he? So, um, like always, we'll have questions. So if you've got some questions, the number will pop up there. You can text them through. We'll answer, answer them uh, a bit later. Um, but let's, uh, let's dive into it. So, so James, uh, just as a bit of a recap, the series of James. Uh, James is reflecting on the teachings of Jesus right throughout the book of James and most, mostly the Sermon on the Mount. So Matthew 5 to 7, he's reflecting on those uh, uh, teachings of Jesus and, he, and he's sort of unpacking them. Um, so it's really important that we understand who is James written to? Who, who's he writing to when he's penning this, this uh, letter um, or all these thoughts? Uh, he is writing to believers, right? He is not writing to unbelievers and saying, hey, this is how you get to heaven when you die. You need to do all of these things. Now, he, he is writing to people who have said, you know what, I'm all in for Jesus. I, I wanna follow Jesus. I wanna live a life that reflects the culture and life of heaven. And, and he's writing to people that have, have made that decision. So if you've made that decision today, then, then this is really applicable for you. Um, and so James is continu continually, continually challenging us to live in a way that bears witness to the kingdom. So, that, so the kingdom of heaven is here. This is what Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is here and our lives bear witness to the kingdom. That is, that is happening all around us. Sometimes we can have our eyes closed and the kingdom is happening around us and we're not bearing witness to it because we don't realize it's here. But James is saying the kingdom of heaven is here. Let's live lives that bear witness to its existence. And so this is the challenge that James is calling us into. And so he's really pushing his thumb, thumb down on this idea that, that a confession alone is not enough. That a confession without a conviction is actually faith in vain. It's quite warm in here, eh? Are we able to just turn the fans on? We don't need to have like the cooling on, but just the fans will get some airflow in here would be great don't want you falling asleep this morning. And so, so um, with a lot of scripture, uh, there's, there's sort of two ideas that scripture will do for us. Uh, the, one purpose of it is it's supposed to bring comfort to the afflicted. All right, so if you're feeling afflicted in your life, maybe you're going through some stuff in your life, like, like scripture should bring comfort into your life. 
um, but also it will afflict your comfort. All right, so, so it, it has this twofold thing where, it, where uh, it'll bring comfort if you're afflicted, but it'll also afflict your comfort. Um, Bruxy Cavey uh, said this. He said, the church exists to comfort the afflicted and sometimes afflict the comfortable. We are a hospital for the hurting, but also a boot camp for the passively pious who need to be mobilized for mission. All right, so there's this both and thing that we are embracing as followers of, of Jesus. And so James is always, uh, he, he's talking about stuff. If you just read James really quickly, sort of at a shallow level, uh, it'll appear like, appear like he's always just talking about our behavior. But what James is really wanting to do is get underneath the behavior and get to our motives. And, and so think about it like an iceberg. Above the water, we just see the tip of the iceberg, but underneath there is a whole lot more. And James is really trying to get underneath what what is causing this little bit of behavior over here? Actually, there's a whole lot more underneath that we need to talk about. Uh, and so, um, so if we're thinking about our, that, that when we have a confession that Jesus is Lord, the only logical response is obedience to the will and way of Jesus. Right? So if we have that confession, the only logical response is obedience to the will and way of Jesus. And so we have to remember that God's commands, that, that Jesus commands, especially in the Sermon on the Mount, they are not restrictive. Like God is not just getting us to do something for the sake of doing it. Uh, I heard Bill Johnson recently say that, that God doesn't ask us to dig a hole there to then just ask us to fill it in just for the sake of it. You know, like these aren't, his commands aren't purposeless. They are actually to bring life. And so they're not restrictive, and when we follow the wills and ways of Jesus, we discover what life really is all about. And so I want to encourage you into that. It, it won't be comfortable, but it will bring life. Uh, Bonhoeffer once said that a person that believes obeys, and he that does not obey cannot believe. And so there's this paradox of faith that God will not change my mind, and I cannot change my heart. But as I change my mind, I step into, and he starts to change my heart. Like it's, it's this partnership with God, and this is what repentance is all about. As we turn, he will turn us. And so we partner with God in, in renewing our, our mind, changing our hearts to become more like him. Isn't it beautiful? Yes. <laughs> Cool. All right, so, so as we look at James 4, uh, we cannot look at James 4 without looking at the previous chapter, because this is just one continual thought. Uh, we get presented the Bible with chapters and verses and all that, but that's not the way it originally was. It's just one continual thought. So we need to jump back into James 3 to sort of unpack um, what uh, James is talking about in, in chapter 4. So he's just finished unpacking this idea that there are two kinds of wisdom. Uh, one is from heaven, and one, one is earthly and unspiritual and demonic. Um, he, but he calls them both wisdom. That's really important, okay? Park that just maybe at the back of your mind. He calls both of them wisdom. Um, then he talks about the wisdom of heaven that produces peace. Peacemakers will sow, uh, will reap a harvest of righteousness. And the other type of wisdom, earthly wisdom, will produce disorder, every evil practice. Um, and so this is the flow where James is heading. So he starts off with this. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they know they come from the desires that battle within you? So what causes fights and quarrels among you? This is a really empowering question that James is starting with. He's flowing out of these ideas that there's two ways to live. And then he says, what is causing fights and quarrels among you? Now, how often do we actually ask ourselves those questions? When we are offended or upset with someone else, how often do we ask, what's the cause of this? We generally look at the surface. You know, they did this, they said that, but James is actually inviting us to look beneath the surface, not just the tip of the iceberg. And he says this, don't they come from your desires that battle within you? He goes on to say, you desire, but you do not have, so you kill, you covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. And so James is now starting to unpack this in light of chapter three. So let me read the part of chapter three that I think he is unpacking further here. 
I'm reading it from the Amplified Version, um, and it goes like this. But if you have bitter jealousy, envy, and contention, rivalry, selfish ambition in your hearts, do not pride yourself on it, and thus be in defiance of and false to the truth. This superficial wisdom is not such as it comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, animal-like, even devilish or demonic. For wherever there is jealousy, envy, and contention, rivalry, and selfish ambition, there will be confusion, unrest, disharmony, rebellion, and all sorts of evil and vile practices. So James is saying, hey, these desires that are underneath the water, jealousy, envy, selfish ambition, these are lurking underneath all of the conflict and the drama, all of the fights and the quarrels, all the selfish ambition. This is what's going on underneath and they are causing you to dehumanize each other and tear one another down. And you're saying this has got to stop. See, what happens is that we inevitably end up living life grasping and taking and this causes fights and wars amongst us. He's not mucking around, eh? So I want to talk a bit this morning about what this bitter envy and selfish ambition is. See, James calls it wisdom. Isn't that interesting? He, he calls bitter envy and selfish ambition wisdom. He just says it's not God's wisdom. right? So, but he calls it wisdom. What is James saying here? I think that James is saying that, that these two things will appear like wisdom to you. You will be able to rationalize these. You will be able to justify these. They will make sense to an unredeemed mind. The unrenewed mind will see these as wisdom. There's the danger. See, it appears right, it's reasonable, it's justifiable, but such wisdom is not from God. See, I can easily justify jealousy. Hey can easily justify selfish ambition. I, I deserve this. Yeah, this was taken from me. They, they, they shouldn't have got that. That should have been mine. You know, and then sometimes we can take that to someone else and they might agree with us and we just feel even more right about the envy and the selfish ambition. But Proverbs 21 verse two says, all a man's ways seem right to him, but the Lord weighs the heart. All right, what is God, God is looking at the heart. What is the motives? What is going on in your heart that you think this is okay, that you have justified this type of earthly wisdom? See, we can often be so blind to these lurking desires beneath the surface of our lives and not even realize that we are living life out of these false scripts of fear. See, they become false scripts. We, we, they just become the normal way of life for us, but they are actually rooted in fear. And James is helping us to get beneath all of this. It's a bit uncomfortable though, eh? It's all right, he gives us a way out. He gives us the answer at the end. Yeah, so he's saying, look, if, you're, if your life is surrounded by drama or relational conflict, if you're feeling left out, overlooked, misunderstood, um, perhaps there are some fear-based, misplaced desires in your heart, and they are creating the environment that you find yourself in. And, and so James emphasizes that these emotions, that ha- they haven't found their home in the heart of the Father. They are misplaced desires that haven't found their home in the heart of the Father, and they are creating huge disunity, conflict, and fights in the body of Christ. And so it appears here that James actually isn't interested in who's right or wrong. He wants to look below the surface and say, hey, what's really going on here? So bitter envy and jealousy. So so both envy and jealousy are emotions of comparison and evidence of a spirit of entitlement. Right, so they are, they are emotions of comparison. Um, uh, the, the language that I, I would use commonly for this is that they are the evidence of an orphan heart. 
Um, in in um, his book, Overcoming Shame, Mark Baker makes these observations about envy and jealousy. He says, both envy and jealousy are emotions of comparison. You are comparing yourself to someone else and you fear you are coming up short. Both feelings are a threat to your sense of worth and both feelings are very dangerous to your joyful relationships with God and others. Yeah. In other words, comparison is the thief of all joy. So James is talking about these desires within. You desire, so you can, but you cannot have, so you kill. This is the language that James is using. He's not saying that you go around murdering people. Um, he's, talk, he's reflecting on the teachings of Jesus here, who says, you know, even if you have anger in your heart, it is this is as if you have murdered someone. He's saying you are reacting with anger and outrage. I love this quote from Braxy Cavey I saw this week. He said, whatever it is that anger and outrage are helping you accomplish, love will do a better job. Yeah? Come on, this is the invitation that James and Jesus are continually calling us, us into. There is a different way to live, think, and act in our world that will produce life. But often we are living these false scripts in our life that are actually not producing life. They are destroying us. And James is inviting us into a new way. He goes on to say, you covet but cannot get, so you quarrel and fight. See, jealousy is the fear that something or someone important to you is about to be taken from you. Right, that something that's important to you is about to be taken from you. And it's this idea that we look at others and say, you have something that I should have had. And envy is the hatred you feel towards another person who reminds us of who we are not. All right, so this is shame. And so both are evidence of an orphan heart, a heart that fears rejection and lack. You have something that I should have had, and a spirit of entitlement says, I deserve what you just got given. But here's the truth, and we need to hear the truth. Our good Father in heaven does not divide himself among us. He is infinite and his love is infinite. He is able to give all of himself to each of his children. He does not divide himself. See, what is given to them was not stolen from you. And the reality is that we always attract what we fear. We need to hear that. We attract what we fear. And then James presses on this even further and he says this, that the thing that you think was stolen from you, God actually doesn't want to give it to you because the motive is wrong. Not because he's mean, but because when the motive is wrong, we inevitably try to take glory for ourselves and we are not made for that kind of glory. It will kill you. It will destroy you. See, the orphan heart is always grasping, fighting for themselves, grasping for position and recognition, which often results in taking. And I'll take what I can't get given. But someone who has found their home in the heart of the Father has no need to grasp as all that is the Father's is theirs. Come on, we, we actually, listen to this. Orphans demand what's entitled to them, but in doing so, forfeit the abundance of the Father's house that is available to them through partnership. We actually forfeit the abundance of the Father's house when we live grasping and taking. Like, it's, it's all yours. Come on, this is the story of the two brothers, the prodigal son and the older brother. Like, this is, it's good, eh? All right, so he says, you do not have because you do not ask. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with the wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. Hey, I, I just really hope that, that maybe you've read this passage this week and you've sort of, you've read it and going, oh yeah, that was cool. Um, but maybe this morning you're going, oh my goodness, I didn't see any of this stuff in this passage. Um, I, I wanna invite you not to just read a passage, read the whole, you know, James 1 to 5, read it together, let it read you. That is the point. Let it read you. Take some time and think, what does James mean by that word? Take some time and let, this, this is how we are renewed. This is how we are changed into the image and likeness of Christ. And we can spend our whole lives reading the Bible 
every day and not actually get to the meat of what Jesus is trying to change in us. And so I want to encourage you. I don't want to just have a church that turn up and, and go, oh, I'll let, I'll let Michael tell me what it's, no, no, no. Let's be a church that do that day in, day out, that letting the scriptures read us. So we turned up, you know, renewed and, ah, yeah, anyway. So what James is saying here is that, is that these deep-rooted heart issues are actually coming out in the way that you pray. You do not have because you do not ask. We must remember that the purpose of prayer is not to persuade a reluctant God to do our bidding. The purpose of prayer is to align our will with His and in partnership with Him to ask Him to accomplish His will on the earth. Right? This is the purpose of prayer. The purpose of prayer is not to change God's mind, but change ours. <laughs> This is not to change God's heart, but to change our heart so that we become more in line with His will. The more we become in line with His will, the more that we release heaven through our lives. This is the purpose of prayer. But it, it, James is saying, hey, sometimes you're actually just asking God to do what you want to do. And it might be good, but the motive is wrong. Yeah. We doing Okay. All right, um, okay, so what is the Father's will? The Father's will. So Jesus said, I only do what I, what I see the Father doing. So he's been his whole life just going, Father, what are you doing? What do you want to do? Father, what's your will? I just, I just want to do that. And, and, and he came and he demonstrated life in the kingdom. And, and the demonstration was this, Father, not my will, but yours. And so this is what he said in the garden, Father, not my will, but yours. And then he spread his arms and died. So, so, what, so what does it look like? Uh, what does the Father's will feel like? A.J. Swoboda, uh, in a brilliant book I'm reading at the moment, he says this, that the Father's will feels like getting crucified. <laughs> like having someone shove a Roman spear in your side and then having the water of your life pour out to the dry, calloused earth below. <laughs> Come follow Jesus. <laughs> This is what it looks like. But the, the point is this, is that when we cross that line, we discover what true life is all about. But before that, we're grasping, trying to take life on our own terms. But Jesus is saying, hey, whoever will give up their life for my sake, they're the ones who will find true life. See, the wrong motives are often rooted in the belief in a lie, the, the lie that I, I am in this on my own and everything good must be taken, grasped or earned through striving and the lie that there is not enough to go around so whatever is given to others, I, it must be stolen from me. And, and so jealousy, envy and selfish ambition become the rationalized wisdom of an orphan heart. All right, just another thought, uh, then we'll get some questions, I think. Okay, um, so I looked up selfish ambition in the Greek lexicon just to see what's James really getting at here with this idea of selfish ambition, and, and this is what it means. It means the seeking of followers and adherents by means of gift. Self-seeking ambition. So, so what, ja what, what James is getting at here is, is he's talking about when we use our gifts that were supposed to bring glory to God but we are clipping the ticket on the way through. Yeah? So we're saying, we're using our gift and saying, all oh, glory to God, but actually, I want a little bit more. <laughs> Come on, you, you, read, you read about the fall of, of the devil. What was he doing? He's clipping the ticket on the way through. So at the root of these misplaced desires is pride and shame, all right? And they are two sides of the same coin. Listen to this. The more pride you have, the more potential shame you can feel. Yeah? So what this looks like is that the orphan heart will always manifest in two extremes, self-righteousness or self-loathing. Two sides of the same coin. False humility, false confidence. Two sides of the same coin. And ultimately they are rooted in fear and that the, the very root fear is the fear of rejection. 
Yeah, if people truly found out who I am, then they would reject me. So envy, jealousy, and selfish ambition become the rationalized wisdom for us to survive. But the Father is saying, you can survive with me. I am enough. You don't need to compare. You don't need to strive. You don't need to fight for recognition. You don't need to fight for any of this. Come join me. All that is mine is yours. How do we know? How do we know if we're following Jesus? Listen, if we're following Jesus, then we will be following him into discomfort. That is a reality. Our, our orphan tendencies will rise up because perfect love drives out fear. Right, so listen to this. When we are, when we are close to the love of Jesus, I, I think we read that passage, eh? Perfect love drives out fear, and so we go, oh, I'm feeling fearful. Can you pray for me that love will just like get rid of it and, and fix me, you know? Um, but here's the reality. If you want perfect love to drive out the fear in your life, the fear will have to rise its ugly head first, and love will come in and drive it out. But you cannot do this through through comfort, it will be uncomfortable. To get fear out of your life will be uncomfortable. And so that's the challenge, all right? So perfect love drives out fear. So when you're close to the love of Jesus, fear will rear its ugly head, and we have to realize this is a good thing. When the fear drive, rears its ugly head, it's because we can bring, bring it near to him and find our hearts healed in the presence of a love that is a consuming fire. All right, so, so it's... When that all rises up, see it as a good thing. Because now I can bring it near to the heart of God. Now I can bring it near to love. But normally when it rears its ugly head, we want to run and hide. But actually this is the time to bring it near to him. And what does James say, say soon? Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Ah, all right, um... Um, I've got two more before questions. Um, all right, let, have we got some questions? Yeah, okay, let's do a couple of questions, and then if I've got time, we'll backtrack a little bit. Cool. All right, uh, so the first person messaged, and they said, good preaching, Mike. Oh, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> we'll uh, just leave it there. Let's go home. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the Greek word defines selfish ambition as acting for one's own gain, regardless of the discord, strife it causes. What is the opposite of this? How do you use your gifts to help others and not be focused on the gain you get? Um, yeah, so I mean, uh, uh, James is gonna bring us to this really soon. Um, it's through humility. So it's always through the pathway of, of humility. Um, and that is, that is the uncomfortable part. So James, so remember James is continuing one thought. Uh, in James five, he's gonna start talking about confessing your sins to one another so that you may be healed. And so what happens when we wanna bring some of these things to the surface? You might realize they're there and we spend a lot of our lives, if you're aware of them, hiding them. <laughs> James is saying, bring them into the light. It finds someone that you, this is the whole point of squads, by the way, that you can sit down with someone and say, I've got this fear and it's eating me alive and it's causing me to kill others. You know, this is the language James is using, no, not murder, but, but it's causing me to dehumanize others and I need to bring it to the light and so we share it with each other. That's humility. Uh, and uh, I mean, we, we don't have time probably to unpack it further. I'm, maybe I'll just carry on next week and unpack this further. But there's a whole, the whole idea of repentance. I think we need to rethink how that, how that actually looks. I don't know if that, is that kind of, yeah. All right, uh, how do you change motive? Um, well, I think first, the first thing we need to do is own it. We need to own that I have selfish motives and, and bring it, again, bring it to the light. Bring it to someone that you trust and say, I, I, I'm hiding the fact that I have selfish motives and I, I need help with that because it's, it's actually dehumanizing others and I don't want to do that. So, so it's actually bringing it to the light. You know, the prayer of a righteous man is powerful, effective. This is what he talks about in James 5. So when we bring it to someone who is trusted, um, we don't want to bring, what, what normally happens is, is we bring envy and jealousy to someone that will agree with us. 
what we need to do is bring envy and jealousy to, some, to someone that will call us up into our identity. Then we can be healed. Yeah. Um, That's not comfortable, by the way. <laughs> yeah. Uh, kind of on the other side of that then, yeah, how do we love others when the stuff is coming up in them? And it's messy. Um, well, a- again, humility. <laughs> um, we, we have to just come, like, have the realization that we all have the stuff going on. And so when it rises up for someone else, this is just an opportunity in humility to, to love them and to help them journey through that. Um, yeah, and uh, sometimes we, no, I don't want to go there. All right. Um, uh, yeah, so again, it's through humility, like just going, actually, this is an opportunity for this person to be loved. Um, yeah, so uh, I'm not going to get there this morning, but at the end, James, James talks about this idea like, who, who is your neighbor? Like, don't judge others because you're meant to love your neighbor, but who is your neighbor? Like, there were some people that asked Jesus that question once, silly question, like, silly, eh, asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? What they were trying to say is, is there some people that we can love and some people that we don't have to love? Um, and and James, uh, Jesus actually turns that whole thing on its on its head, he, he shares the story of the, um, uh, the, the Good Samaritan, right? So the Good Samaritan, has anyone ever known, like if I asked you, who's the neighbor? I guarantee you 90% of us would say, well, the, the guy that got hurt on the road. You know, we're meant to love our neighbor that's hurt and you know, the, the rude people walk past him. No, Je- Jesus points at the three people that walk past and said, which one of them is your neighbor? See, see the, que- the point is this, is Jesus is going, while you're arguing about who is your neighbor, you need to ask the question, what type of person are you? Because who, the question about who is, who is a neighbor is not about their identity, but about yours. And, and so our ability to love others about as, as, as a neighbor is actually speaking to our identity, not theirs. And so if I can't love someone whose fear is rising up, that's speaking more about my identity than theirs. Because I, my job is to love. And, and, and if, if, they, if they've got offended at me or if I've, I've offended at them, that doesn't mean I get to turn my love off. Because my identity is not in someone else's reaction or whatever else is going on external to, to me. It's about what's going on the inside of me. And so, so Jesus flips that question on its head, as he does with just about everything, and he says there's a third way. Jesus, eh? Like, the wisdom from heaven. <laughs> yeah. All right, is it that? That's it? Okay. Um, music team can come back up. That'd, that'd be great. Um, well, I've done that bit on the neighbors, so. Yeah, I'll just finish with this bit, and I, I might carry on next week with this passage if that's okay. We've got time for that? Yeah. All right, so, so, um, so James moves on to this, this here, you, you adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means in, enmity with God? And so what's James talking about here? He, he's not writing to a whole lot of people and saying, oh, you guys are all cheating on each other, you adulterous people. No, no, that's not what he's saying. Um, what he's actually talking about here is that um, he is talking about faithfulness to the covenant. He's referring to this idea that, that, that we are the bride of Christ. A, a, and when we live dehumanizing others, we are being unfaithful to the covenant that we've been called into, the covenant of love. A, and so he's, he's saying, you, you, you adulterous people, you, you're actually cheating on Jesus when you dehumanize one another. When you choose, choose to compare, when you choose to use envy and selfish ambition, when you choose to judge one another, you are actually, it's like you are cheating on Jesus because you've been unfaithful to the covenant of love that I've called you to live in and walk in. <laughs> this, is, this is what James is getting at. And so he, he's saying, you know, we, we learned last time that, that how we love others is how we love God. So, so to say that I'm right with God, but live in relational conflict with others around us is actually, it, it, it can't be. 
But to, to love God is to love others. And so when I reconcile with others, I'm reconciling with God. When I forgive others, I, you know, like I'm not forgiving God because he hasn't done anything mean, but do you know what I mean? Like, like we, we are, we are re- restoring our relationship with God as we restore our relationships with one another. And, and he goes on to talk about this idea that we could live in opposition to God when we carry this type of posture of living in conflict with one another. That, that this posture of misdirected envy, jealousy, and selfish ambition is actually friendship with the world's wisdom. I mean, it's really easy to read that passage and go, oh yeah, well, I'm not living friendship to the world. I don't go to clubs and I don't do this and I don't do that. No, no, this is, James is not talking about what you do externally. He's talking about what's going on the inside of us. And he's saying it's possible to do all of those things right and still live at an opposition to God because of the, the, the turmoil that's going on in your own inner world. Yeah, I don't, Jesus does. I'm just telling you what Jesus sees. Yeah. See, and then he finishes with this. God appro- opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. It's, it's, it's that simple, my friends. God opposes the proud. He gives grace to the humble. Humility is the way. Jesus came to us in the most humble form. He came as a baby in a manger. You know, he could have come with power and lights and, you know, all of that sort of stuff, but he chose to come in a way to show us how to live. And then he hung on a cross naked for all to see. And I think that's an invitation that when we come to the cross, we must also come naked. Not physically, that'd be weird, but In the garden, Adam and Eve, naked and ashamed, what do they do? They cover themselves with fig leaves. They hide in the bushes. No, no, God wants us to come naked so that he can clothe us. And so we come in humility. We come saying, like realizing that I have nothing to add to this. I can't come to the cross and say, Jesus, I'm so thankful that you died for me, but hey, did you see how good I was last week? Did you see you know, all of the stuff that I've done? No, no, just come naked. That's all he wants. Let him clothe you. That's what it means to come in humility. Let's stand. We're gonna gather around um, communion. So what, did, what do I have here? Yeah, and I think communion communion is the time that we we come to the table and I think the table of humility like maybe that's just where it's at for us today just to say I'm going to come to Jesus I'm coming to the table as the table of humility and to, to come in humility will cost you it will cost you all of the things that you thought were adding to your life but were actually destroying. It, it will cost you your pride. Uh, for me, the most, the most beautiful times I've had with God have been the most embarrassing. The, the times where I, I'm just a crying, blubbery mess. Why? Because in those moments, pride is gone. I'm not trying to wear a mask. I'm not trying to put on a facade and go, hey, look at me. No, I'm just coming to God, just me. Naked, feeling a little bit ashamed. But it's in those moments that, that He moves so powerfully. So this is communion. We come to this table every week, the table of humility cross that reminds us of our Savior, not in pride, but in humility, hanging naked for all to see. 
So let's come this morning to the table. And uh, I, I just want you to respond in whichever way you feel is appropriate this morning. May, maybe you feel like you actually need to go to someone this morning and, 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 and reconcile. Maybe you just need to come and just get on your knees and just let, let the presence of God saturate you this morning. Whatever it looks like for you. Father, we just thank you for your presence. Father, we thank you that there is nothing that we can bring that could add to what you want from us. There's only one thing that you want from us. One thing, listen to this church, the one thing that God wants from you, and it's nothing. Thank you, God, that you want nothing. You're not expecting me to bring anything to the table but in fact, that's actually how you want me. And so Father, we thank you that as we come to the table this morning, that, that all of us carry, uh, uh, you know, whatever, we have these desires in our hearts and, and we know that they are, they are not from you. They, they, are, they are the world's wisdom. And, and Father, we wanna lay those down this morning because we wanna represent you well. But we wanna see the kingdom of heaven coming into this earth. We wanna see relationships restored. We wanna see reconciliation. We wanna see the beauty of unity and love saturating this valley. And we know that that comes through us from you. And so we wanna, we wanna just get rid of the muck. Get rid of the stuff that is, that is actually not demonstrating you well. And we want to bring it to your table this morning. We want to lay it at your feet and say, Jesus, would you clothe me? Clothe me in humility. Clothe me in your love. Clothe me in your grace. Clothe me in your mercy. We thank you, God. Yeah. Father, we thank you for your grace and your mercy this morning. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God.